I'm going to get to solutions in a second. But I don't think we can figure out how to get around, how, to, how, how we can rebuild a race and class narrative without understanding how racism actually works. And the single biggest mistake that people on the left make is to adopt essentially a right-wing understanding of racism. So if you think back to the 60s, we understood that racism was institutional, we understood that it was cultural, right? But since the 1960s, the right has been insisting that racism can only take one form, that of the bigot. Now, it helps that Donald Trump has a lot of bigots, right? So it's like, yeah, that's, that, that sort of racism, it's bad. I got it, okay? But for the right, if that's the only form racism can take, that allows them to say, hey, I condemn racism too. I'm not a racist because I'm not wearing a pointy cap and I'm not wearing Jews will not, and I'm not yelling Jews will not replace us. Therefore, just because I'm talking about inner cities and thugs and illegal aliens and terrorists and makers and takers and the American heartland and the silent majority and a hardworking, decent middle class, none of that's race because racism is only open bigotry. Right? So this idea of racism as, as bigotry, it's a huge problem for the left. It's a strategy on the right and a huge problem on the left. But you see it on the left. You see people think about dog whistle politics in terms of this story. They think dog whistle politics is a system in which politicians communicate a message to their voters that the voters, that their base clearly understands. So when Donald Trump says, kick off those SO, fire those SOBs, or when Donald Trump says, make America great again, in this version of dog with the politics, what he's communicating is make America white again, and what his base is hearing is make America white again, that they get, right? And in this sense, this is a version of dog with the politics as a secret handshake. Right? Like most of the public doesn't get it, but if you're in the know and somebody shakes your hand and squeezes, I don't know, twist, I don't know whatever, you know that they're in the club with you. Right? That is, the intended audience hears clearly and consciously the intended message. If this is a story about a message of white dominance, then the intended base must be bigots. Right? And now you got a choice. You can be you can say, you can look around the country and say, there's just not that many bigots out there. I mean, yeah, there's some alt-right, there's that crazy Breitbart stuff, there's charts, but there's just not that many bigots out there. And if there's not that many bigots, then there can't be that much dog whistling. Because dog whistling requires a bigoted speaker and a bigoted audience, right? Because racism only operates as bigotry. Or, if you're a radical, you can say, actually, we're a nation of bigots. Actually, they all, every one of Trump's voters, they heard what he was saying. They understood he meant make, make America white again. Right? And you get this radical critique that says, we're a nation of bigots. And it follows from that that we can't cooperate with those people. Because how are you going to find common cause politically with people who are open, open, out and open bigots? If, if some, I mean, wait, you got deprogram? Come on. If you think that this is a nation of bigots, you're gonna, you're gonna pull away. You're, that you're, gonna, you're gonna move to it saying, we really just, we need to take care of our own, we need to withdraw, we need to be isolated, right? This is the model, but it's, but it's predicated on this idea that racism can only take the form of hate. 